Reading from Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father! And he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand, and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham! He said to him, Here am I. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy, or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Good morning. And though you can be seated, don't, don't stop responding to, to the truth of the gospel and even through the message you know, um, please, it, uh, it primes the pump, so to speak, of the one who's speaking. So, so enjoy the interaction. Come up. So welcome here. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, we really do have much to be thankful for, even in the midst of a world that's broken, even in the midst of our own brokenness, yet because of, of Jesus. What an amazing God that, that I think when, even when I wasn't giving a thought about him, had, he was not on my radar, even that, and yet in love, he pursued me. And Jesus came and lived the life that I couldn't live, died the death I should have died. To be loved like that and just in pursued like that in love when I didn't care about him is pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing, amazing grace. And we learn about that really, really in this book. And, you know, there's times when, when I read the Bible, there's sometimes I am just, my mind is completely just blown away. And, and this study that we're going to talk about today was a, uh, one of those times, and it's a passage that I have taught on before uh, several times, but it's kind of like the, that movie you like to go back and you just rewatch it and you're just waiting even for the lines, you know, so I, I enjoy coming back to this passage. And the last time that we taught it in the theater here was just when we had just kind of launched uh, the church plant in the theater back in 2011. So it's been a number of years, and, and we needed an extra message in order to sync up with Grace Warman and, and Grace Evergreen um, so we can get back on track because we were kind of a, a message ahead. So we have the delay. So we, this message is our delay yeah. to get everything all synced back up again. And so we decided that's what we do this Thanksgiving weekend. I've also come to realize that, that I don't actually need to to try to prove to someone that the Bible is actually a very word that's come to us from God. It's, it's way easier just to let the scripture speak for itself. And when you actually study what's written in the pages of this book, you pretty soon realize that no human could have written the things that are in here. And in fact, no human would have written the things that are in here. Now, I didn't grow up in a, in a Christian home. I didn't grow up in the Christian church. Um, and I didn't believe the Bible was God's word. In fact, I just, you know, figured it was full of contradictions, just the opinions of, of men, ideas that they had. And so I rejected it without giving it any meaningful examination at all. But now that I have, the more I actually gaze into this book, the more my faith and confidence in God has just grown and 
And just my wonder and amazement uh, in him has, has just grown as well. And, and I hope that the presentation of these truths this morning are going to advance your faith and joy in the glorious God of heaven and earth and his amazing salvation that he has provided for sinners like you and like me in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I, I did used to think that this Bible was, was just simply a book of archaic rules and, and ideas but I really had no idea how the Bible was actually put together. I, I didn't realize that it was first and foremost a story, the story of Jesus. And so uh, really, even if we boiled the whole Bible down to seven words, so it's pretty good, it's a pretty big book. So if you can boil it down to, to one word, we would say, it's Jesus. Yeah, it's Jesus. Who is God? Right answer. Yeah. And but, but if we put it down to even seven words, I think we'll put them up on the screen, but you can see it really all begins with God. It's, it's really a revelation of who he is, his person, his character. It's really about him first and foremost. So it starts with God. In the beginning, God, he was before anything else. And then he created, he started a creation, and it was good. And so we read, it was good, and this was created, and it was good. But then we have the fall. And that changed everything. Early on in the story, Genesis chapter 3, you've got the humans, the creatures, basically rebel against the creator, decide they're going to go their own way. They're going to now do what they want to do. They want to run their own life and decide for themselves what's good and what's evil. And really that just casts the whole world into chaos, into brokenness, and it separates us from God and it separates us from one another. But God... But God promised a deliverer, and then Jesus came in answer to that promise to bring about redemption, and now the invitation goes out to come to Jesus for the salvation that he offers based on the work he did on the cross and his resurrection, and then finally, we reach the restoration, which really, if you read the description at the end of Revelation 22, it's the world we all want. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. A life with God, reunited again. So that's the Bible. We, uh, you didn't expect, you, you say, what did you cover this morning? We covered the entire Bible, right? Genesis right through to Revelation. But we do learn this, that God was not simply a spectator, right? In the creation and in the fall and the onward march of time and the history of mankind. Throughout history, God was showing that the promised blessings of God's favor can only come upon a sinner through the grace and wisdom of God. And in fact, everything in history was working towards the glorious fulfillment of God's promise in Jesus. Everything was moving towards what the scripture says in Galatians 4, that fullness of time when God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Incredible. And in particular, things were moving towards that day on the cross where man manifested what he was and God manifested what he was. Peter in Acts 2 made it very clear that the cross was the eternal purpose of God, where he says, him, speaking of Jesus of Nazareth, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you've taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So God purposes and no one can stop his plan. In fact, God even is able to use the evil plans of his enemies who hated Jesus, put him to death to providentially work out his good pleasure. I just love that, right? When God makes a promise, nothing can change it. The Lord stated in Isaiah 46, 11, he says, indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I also will do it. Someone's in charge of the universe, right? And somehow, even though you've got billions of people, everybody's just doing their own thing. Everybody's thinking their thoughts, doing what they want to do. They're making their own choices. Many of those choices are not good. Many of them are even motivated by wrong motivations, even motivated by evil. And yet someone, someone beyond my comprehension, God is working out purposes for the good of those who love him. 
God is beyond us. Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 40, 28 says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable. Job tells us all that we can comprehend about God is just the mere edges of his ways. I love a God I can't comprehend, right? Who's so far above me, because that's a God who's worthy of my praise and worship and trust. I don't want a God who's just a little bit above me. I need a God like this, like the Bible unfolds. Now, the word providence is a term that's used to describe the way in which God, in an unseen way, just uses ordinary events to actually bring about his purposes and his plan. And that's why I just love to call him the great God of coincidence. The great God of coincidence. And we can see, as humans really, we can really only understand control and and doing things like that, like a, a puppet on a string, Right, or controlling the pieces on a chessboard, or controlling uh, a programmed, computerized robot that we're in control. That's how we understand control. Right? That's the only way we can control as creatures. But God is not like us. He can accomplish his purposes and have people at the same time do their own thing, make decisions, make choices for which they're totally responsible. And thus, People do what they want to do, and all the while, they're actually fitting into a grander scheme that's being worked out by an infinitely wise and holy and powerful God, such as that day on the cross. When people cried out for the blood of Jesus in hatred, they were not going to have this man rule over them. They weren't going to have anybody tell them what to do, not even God. And yet, the death of Jesus at the hands of evil men is the very plan of God for our salvation. Amazing. What they meant for evil, God actually purposed and worked together for good, for our good. Jesus' accomplishment on the cross is just central to the Bible and the whole story. All of human history, first it was promised moving towards it and then fulfilled in time. And so today what we want to look at is just one of those amazing promises of which the Bible's full of. You see, God was not taken by surprise at the fall when the first humans rebelled against God God had a plan. And in time, God called out a man named Abram. And he did this when this guy had no interest or knowledge of God at all. No interest to God. And God chose him, changed his name to Abraham, and made a promise that through him, through one of his offspring, would come the Redeemer, a rescuer, to conquer sin, Satan, death, and hell on behalf of all who would put their trust in him. So incredible grace, God told Abraham that he was going to bless him by making the way back to a right relationship with God through a promised son. And not only would this blessing be for Abraham, but this opportunity to be reconciled to God would be for all the nations of the world through this offspring of Abraham, a way to restore us to a love relationship with God and the world we all want. So when Abraham's wife, Sarah, who had been barren, she was well past childbearing years. In fact, she was 90. Abraham was 100. Yet at age 90, she gave miraculous birth to a son, Isaac. Laughter. No wonder they called him laughter, right? Abraham experienced the reality that God is true to his word, that God will keep his promises, and that God can be trusted no matter how impossible it seems. 
And now in Genesis 22, the passage that we had read earlier, God would give another amazing promise. The ultimate fulfillment of this promise would also involve a son whose birth would come about in a miraculous way. The offspring in whom was bound up all the promises to free us from the curse of sin and death, to bring us back to a restored relationship with God who is love. So let's pick up the story in Genesis 22. Genesis 22, be it verse 1. After these things, so that's the miraculous birth of Isaac, all the things that had happened, God making a, a covenant promise with him. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, that's God, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, first off, it's important to notice that Abraham is not asked to murder his son, but he's asked to offer him up, to sacrifice him as a burnt offering. You see, God is not asking Abraham to commit a crime, but rather to execute a judgment that's justly due. See, the wages of sin is death, and God can justly require the death of any sinner. So the very fact that God does not execute all of us, but suffers long with us, is because of his great mercy, his great mercy and kindness. So this is a great test of faith, though. Isaac, remember, he's the son of promise, right? So Isaac was the miraculous gift that God had given to Abraham in his old age. He was his only son. And only through him could come the promised deliverer, the Messiah. So in other words, no Isaac means no fulfillment of the promise. No Isaac, no hope. The promise of God and this commandment that God has given Abraham seem to be at odds with one another. Now, it's also peculiar that Abraham is directed to a particular mountain. Where is he directed? Verse 2. Moriah, right? So he's directed to a mountain of Moriah. And we're going to note more of this later, so just keep that in your mind, that it's a particular mountain he's directed to go to. Verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, the son of promise. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. So now, Though Abraham couldn't really understand, you can truly see that Abraham trusted God who had given him this son in the first place in this miraculous way. He trusted God's goodness, and so he obeyed the word of the Lord. Right away, he, be, he obeys to what God had called him. And Abraham just knew that God deserved his total trust. He didn't try to figure out everything God was doing, and likewise, we can rarely do that, right? Right? However, like Abraham, we're called to rest in the character of God. Rest in what we know about the heart and goodness and character of God. Even when we can't see, even when we can't understand what he's doing. Now again, verse 4, right? And the end of verse 3, the setting is a particular place to which Abraham was called to, to which God directed him. Now, why would he have to go on a three-day journey to get to this specific mount when, if you know anything about the land, there'd be many areas back at that time, especially, there would have been many secluded mountains, many secluded areas. There could have been things just right in his backyard. He could have just went almost anywhere to get to a nice secluded spot, a nice secluded mountain. Why did he have to go on a three-day journey to get to Moriah and the mount there? Well, verse 5. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. 
And Abraham took the the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire, the torch, and the knife. And they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, interesting, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. See, Abraham believes that the Lord will provide. He may not have any idea, he has no clue how, but he knows God. He has confidence in God, and as we shall see, God does provide. Verse 9, when they came to the place of which God told him. Do you see how that's being emphasized over and over again? Like all through this, almost every second verse, it's to this place, a specific place, this place. So we, we see that certainly this location is very significant to God. It says, Abraham then built the altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar, which means Isaac was very willing. He willingly laid his life and was obedient to his father because uh, Abraham was like 100 years old. Well, he was 100 when he was born, so he'd be 114-ish. So there was no way he could have pinned him down unless the son Isaac was willing to lay down his life and to be bound here. And so he bound him, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife, to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And now I'm sure Abraham was very glad to respond. Here am I, you know. Verse 12, he said, that's God speaking. Do, the angel of the Lord speaking, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his own son. So the the ram caught in the brambles by the horns so that the body would still be that perfect without blemish sacrifice So that because you couldn't offer a blemished sacrifice. So Abraham called the name of that place, again, that place that's been that place from the very beginning of this chapter, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, the day even that Moses was writing this, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And then if we jump to verse 18, he then makes it clear about the promise once again, and in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now, on one level, this is a grand story of faith, right? It's the kind of faith and trust and obedience that we're to have. Sometimes we have to go through difficult circumstances where we can't see what's ahead. We can't understand what's happening. And are we willing to give up everything to God? Is he truly our first love? And we might not know until heaven why things sort of were the way they were, but we can trust God's wisdom and goodness. But I think that we're actually called to see something beyond just an illustration of great faith. If you begin to reflect on this story with New Testament eyes, this passage actually leads us to Calvary and the cross of Jesus. See, God can't compromise his character. And our sin is so horrendous, it deserves the judgment and wrath of God. There will be a final judgment. And this offering of Isaac is not going to be enough. It is not sufficient. In fact, Isaac himself is a sinner. He can't die for another. He can really only die for his own sin. If only there could be a substitute that could be accepted. If God is to bless, then he must provide an acceptable atoning sacrifice. Another must stand in this place and pay the price of redemption. See, that ram could only substitute in the place of Isaac in a temporary way. So Isaac in this offering of of Abraham, you know, he got his son back. They were able to go back home for a temporary time, but nothing beyond that. It's only a temporary nature. The blood of rams and bulls and goats could never take away sin. Not the death and judgment 
that comes as a result of it. But however, the knowledge of where the Bible goes from here makes it clear that the substituted ram that stayed the knife points forward to one who is to come, who would be sacrificed then, that great and ultimate Lamb of God. So indeed, Jesus, God's only begotten Son, He will provide, He will pay the ultimate redemptive price. And this looking beyond the ram is established by the future tense of the verbs that He uses in verse 14. I mean, look at it. In verse 14, though Isaac now has already been spared because the ram has already been sacrificed, so the exchange there has already been made, and what does Abraham call the place? Right? He says, the Lord will provide. Right? He doesn't say, the Lord has provided. He's not talking about Isaac and the ram, because otherwise he would have said, well, the Lord has provided. The Lord did provide. It's done. He says, oh no, the Lord will provide. He's looking for another day. See, he's looking for another provision in the future. And that's why Jesus said this about Abraham in John 8, 56. He said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Jesus says what Abraham is recognizing this day is God himself would provide a lamb. He's going to provide the Savior. God himself would come. He's, these things are all coming together for him. And then the promise is clearly given. Here's the promise in verse 14, right? On the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Abraham's looking forward to Jesus' day and he saw it and was glad. See, God, who is faithful to all his promises, said that he would provide the lamb, a substitute on the mount of the Lord. Now we begin to see why it was that Abraham was commanded to have to go on a three-day journey to get to one specific mountain of Moriah. See, the scripture unfolds for us. Why make this three-day journey? Why that particular spot? Why is Abraham directed to a specific mountain of Moriah? Because it's on this mountain the Lord will provide. God had his eye on Mount Moriah. So now we've got to jump forward. We've already been back 4,000 years ago to Abraham. We've got to jump in the future now to 3,000 years ago, 1,000 years in the future from Abraham's day uh, to, to now the time of King David. Now, in response to a rash and unbelieving action of King David, God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. So I want you to turn in your Bible now, go to the right, and we're going to turn to 1 Chronicles 21. And it'd be helpful if you turn there, because then you get to see the surrounding context, because we can't show you it all on the screen. So if you're there, it'll be helpful. 1 Chronicles chapter 21, and we're going to pick it up so you can see that David had done this sin. He had gone wrong. He had not trusted God. He was going to do it his own way again. And so in response to this, there's this judgment. We'll pick it up at verse 15. First Chronicles 15, it says, And God sent the angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw. Now, we're not told what he saw yet. And he relented from the calamity. He stopped. He said to the angel who was working destruction, it is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So the Lord saw this particular spot, this threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And when the Lord saw that, he told that angel of death, that angel of judgment, that's enough, stop. So he reached that place, it stopped. And when you read the next verse, in fact, it's like this angel of judgment basically stops in mid-sword swing. 
It's like the sword is coming down of judgment, and it's like God says, stop. And he says, there's this threshing floor right there. So verse 16 says, and David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth, and in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces. Right? You just see it. Just mid-sword swing, stop. Now, if you continue to read the event, 1 Chronicles 21, so if you have it open, you can look and just see what happens next. You're going to see in verses 18 and 19 that David is commanded to purchase this plot of land from Ornan the Jebusite. And once he purchases it, after some haggling there, he purchases the land, and then he's to build an altar to the Lord on that threshing floor. On that threshing floor. And once David purchases this spot, he builds the altar, he offers burnt offerings, it says, and peace offerings there. Then in verse 27, you can see this. The angel of judgment returns his sword to its sheath. You see that? Now, where was the location of that threshing floor? Well, where they would thresh, right? The threshing floor would be up on a hill or mountain. Right? So they could cast the grain up, the wind would blow, blow the chaff away, the grain would fall down. That's where they would, they would have this, this spot. This is where the threshing floors would be. Well, you're going to turn now to the right in your Bible. So we're going to keep moving through our Bible. And you want to get to 2 Chronicles. So just turn to your right a few pages. 2 Chronicles chapter 3. And we want to see where exactly is this threshing floor? What is this spot that God noticed when he told that angel of judgment to stop. Where is it that David bought that threshing floor and, and offered peace offerings for? Well, 2 Chronicles 3, 1 provides the answer. We read there in verse 1, 2 Chronicles 3. Then Solomon, so now we're to David's son Solomon as king. He began to build the house of the Lord, that's the temple, in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David, his father, at the place that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So where was it? Mount Moriah, again. That was that spot, Mount Moriah. Now, Mount Moriah is the mountain ridge that runs through Jerusalem. Jerusalem was was built upon Mount Moriah. So you can't think in terms of the Rocky Mountains, right? If that's what you're picturing, you're going to have to change your picture, your image, because Mount Moriah is not a single peak. Mount Moriah is an elongated ridge, right? Sort of like more like the foothills, more rocky foothills. And it's somewhere along that Rocky Mountain Ridge, Moriah, where Abraham had been directed to take his son Isaac and offer him there up as a burnt offering. And it was upon this ridge, this mountainous ridge, where God then had provided a ram to substitute for Isaac. And it was here upon Mount Moriah, over a thousand years after that time, that a city had been built, a wall had been built around that city, a temple had been put on that very spot, where the sacrifices that foreshadowed Jesus and his once for all sacrifice continually took place in that temple. All the Passover lambs, the day of atonement, the morning and evening sacrifices, the blood was shed, but could never take it away. But it was all anticipating Jesus who would sacrifice himself. So this mountain ridge of Moriah, you need to understand, actually had when they built the city of Jerusalem, the old city, they had to cut through that ridge right, to be able to build the wall. And when they cut through that ridge to build the road and the wall around the city of Jerusalem, on the outside edge of the mountainous ridge, it kind of looked like a skull. So it got the name Golgotha, Calvary, on Mount Moriah, an edge of that. So that particular place of Mount Moriah, known as Golgotha, And down through the centuries, the promise rang out, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. 
So think about this. From that day, when the first son of promise, Isaac, bore the burden of the wood for the offering, and he climbed that mount, until the day when the ultimate son of promise bore the cross and ascended that mount to make a peace offering. From the day when the knife of judgment was stretched out over Isaac, the son of promise, in the hand of Abraham, and God, looking at that spot, cried out, Stop! To that day in David's time, when the sword of judgment was stretched out against Jerusalem in the hand of the angel of the Lord, and God, looking upon that spot, cried out, Stop! Until that day when God's own son was under the sword of judgment, and this time there was no cry of stop. Here God did not stay the knife as the sword of judgment was plunged into the bosom of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was Jesus, the offspring of Abraham, who willingly bore his cross up Mount Moriah to become the ultimate peace offering for all the sons and daughters of Abraham, all the children of faith in Jesus, the full atonement of Jesus, dying in our place, dying there instead of me. And that causes the angel of death and judgment to forever sheath his sword. If that don't ring your bell, something's wrong with your clapper. You know what we say now? You know what we herald now as followers of Jesus? We herald this news. On the mount, the Lord has provided. Jesus cried out from the cross, it is finished. On the mount of the Lord, it has been provided. There is a savior for sinners. This book is amazing. When you start putting all the pieces together in this one marvelous unfolding story. Let's close with just turning to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. So if you're in 2 Chronicles still, it's just a little bit more to your right to get to the Psalms. About the middle of your Bible. Psalm 118 Verse 19, the psalmist writes this. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. There's a way to become righteous with God. There's a way to enter into the presence of God. And it's through the door or gate who is God himself, Jesus. Verse 21, I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. And here's how it happened. Verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected. And they rejected and they said, crucify him, crucify him. And he was crucified. And he has become the cornerstone. In his resurrection, God has appointed and set him up as king of all kings and lord of all lords. He has done it. There is an acceptable sacrifice. Verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. We get the joy. He gets the glory. He's done it all. He gets all the credit he deserves. And we get to be loved like this. We get the grace. We get the joy. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Do you see when it talks about this is the day, what day it's talking about? The day of the cross, the day when they rejected the stone, the day that Jesus accomplished there, the day he went up Mount Moriah and died as this substitute. That's the day the Lord has made. That's the day that he had planned. On the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. That was God's promise. 
And in the rejection of Jesus, his death in our place, God has raised him up, set him up as the chief cornerstone, and we rest on him because he's done everything that we need for God to accept us and to be received fully as sons and daughters into his family. It's wonderful. This is the day the Lord has made, that day on Mount Moriah on the cross. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. See, this day today, what's the date? 13th? October 13th? This day, October 13th, is a day of salvation because of that day that the Lord made on Mount Moriah when God himself provided the lamb a sacrifice. And this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And we have much reason to be thankful because of this. We can be thankful this Thanksgiving for the day that the Lord has made. The day when the Lord himself provided the lamb. The day that purchased our forgiveness and our salvation. That has won for us entrance into the love and presence of God now and onward forever. Is not our sovereign God most glorious in working out his provinces? his providences, his plan, his purposes. Like, I just go, here's people, everybody just doing their own thing, doing what they want to do, and somehow God is working out his plan. That's good news to me. In the end, you know what the cost was to Abraham in the end? Nothing but to trust him. The only cost to Abraham was trust him. Trust God put all his hope, put all his reliance in God and in his word. The cost to God was everything. So let's celebrate the day that the Lord has made. That day when he provided the lamb himself on Mount Moriah, that particular place. And we'll do that in the breaking of bread together as Mark comes up.